we'll go ahead and convene the meeting at this time. Uh, I think uh, what we'll do for persons who are like 65 and over who need a little extra attention, that we'll introduce ourselves to reinforce them. <laughs> Jim Kemp, Mayor Hills. Susan Mims, Iowa City City Council. Kathy Knievel, Hill City Council. Jill Dodds, Coralville City Council. Lori Goodrich, Coralville City Council. Lisa Green, Douglas, Johnson County. Okay. Terry Don Hugh, North Liberty. And yes, we have room. Janelle Reddick, Board of Supervisors. John Thomas, Iowa City City Council. Pauline Taylor, Iowa City City Council. Jim Throgmorton, Mayor of Iowa City. Janet Godwin, Iowa City School District School Board. Uh, J.P. Uh, Clausen, uh, School Board. Sean Eistel, all of the School Board. Rod Sullivan, Johnson County. And Kirk um, Freeze, Johnson County. Megan Foster, Coralville City Council. Yes, we do have our regular church going people who sit in the back, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have quite a bit for discussion tonight. We'll start with an update on Solarize Johnson County, a group purchasing program for residential solar. Becky Soglin. How about Josh? I'll take, <laughs> we'll take it. We'll take it. So gave Becky the night off. So Josh Bussard, Director. Uh, Johnson County Planning, Development, and Sustainability. If you have any questions, uh, go ahead and interrupt me and ask, but I'll just give a quick uh, quick update and read off what Becky, our sustainability coordinator, told me to read off. <laughs> so uh, she wanted to communicate to all the cities that it's been a, a great effort um, and that we selected Moxley to be the installer and we're working with MREA, Midwest Renewable Energy Association, on Solarize Johnson County. So thank you to everybody that helped. Uh, the program is in full swing and actually it is about to uh, wrap up. Um, and the program, it includes uh, essentially its pricing adjustments. It's a group buy for solar panels and we get different incentives as we reach different kilowatt thresholds. <coughs> so we've already reached the second milestone of 150 kilowatts of solar panels that have been purchased in Johnson County um, and the West Branch area. We're well on our way through our third milestone, which is 250 kilowatt hours. So that translates into, uh, we're almost at 15 cents off per kilowatt, I believe. Don't quote me on that. I was hoping Chris Hoffman would be here. Um, uh, we've hosted 18 solar power hours and uh, we only have four solar power hours remaining. It's, uh, it's important to note that if you want to be involved in this uh, group purchase program that you need to attend one of the solar power hours and you can uh, go on the county website and you can uh, review where those power hours are but if you're really curious I can read them off to you at least the next two, July 18th, 6.30 p.m. at the Hills Community Center, and then Thursday, July 19th uh, at uh, here in North Liberty. It's in the same building as uh, probably Butcher Cafe Moose. So, um, and then we have another one on July 31, and the last one is at the County Administration Building on August 2nd. Uh, we've had more than 500 leads. It's been a very successful program. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll take those. No? All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions for the gentleman before he sits down? If not, we'll move ahead. Update on Behavioral Health Urgent Care Center, Matt Miller. Sir, hello. Um, some of you folks know me already uh, that I've worked with, but I'm a new face for others. So I guess one major update is Johnson County hired a project manager. Hi. Um, <laughs> to help get this off the ground. Um, I officially started uh, May 15th, so I've had a couple months on the job, and uh, we're moving forward, uh, making a lot of progress. Um, I think something that just became public last week was the purchase of property was voted on by the supervisors. Um, and now we're going to move forward with our due diligence and hopefully get that land squared away and complete the purchase there so that we can uh, move on to the next phases like construction. Um, we're also uh, working pretty hard on some other aspects <coughs> of the project. Um, we're working to form a legal entity made up of all the other municipalities and other folks working on this. Um, so I think 
many of you folks will be directly involved uh, in those talks when we're ready to uh, engage with those, which should be very soon. Um, we're also working on uh, pursuing a managing entity to help us run this access center once it's up and running. Um, so between the construction, between the legal structure, uh, between the managing entity, those are some big things that are, are filling up our time right now. Um, at, at a certain point, we should have a budget set. We're getting close as we start doing these things, obviously with the purchase of property, that gives us a specific dollar amount. Um, we're meeting with civil engineers and we have an architect firm that we're gonna be working with starting this week. So we'll get some additional figures from them. And then at some point we'll go out to bid um, to get a, a construction firm to help build that. So at that point, we'll have some solid figures for a budget. Um, I know many of you guys have been um, engaged in the past about helping with the capital cost for this project. Um, as soon as we have a specific ask, we'll probably be coming back to you guys to see uh, what you can do to, to work with us. Do you guys have any questions for me at this point? All right, well, if not, um, I'll try to get my contact information out there. I think you can find me on the Johnson County website. So if anybody would like to reach out one-on-one, um, -on -one, I'm glad to meet with anybody. Thank you. Thanks, man. Next item, annexation policy on affordable housing, Iowa City. Yeah, hi everybody. So I just wanted to make sure that you knew that we are in the process of, cons well, we're considering an amendment to our comprehensive plan that would require all voluntary annexations that include a certain number of residential units or higher would have to have uh, a certain percentage of affordable units contained within them or else make a payment in lieu of that. And one of the things we're considering tomorrow night is, well, uh, considering the overall amendment to the comp plan, but we're also considering a, a possible amendment to one sentence within the plan. And that one sentence really is about trying to make sure that uh, when we're exercising discretion, we give considerable weight to achieving helping the school district achieve better balance among its school, um, among its various elementary schools especially. And I want to thank, <coughs> and who else spoke? Uh, uh, Lori, yeah, Lori spoke, and uh, well, was Sean there, was the last was Sean? Too, so. No, Paul. Paul oh, and Lori were there. They, they both came to our last meeting. I wanna, <laughs> wanted to thank them for coming and speaking out on behalf of the amendment to the comprehensive plan. But I just wanted to make sure you all knew that that was in progress, in process, and we'll be voting on it, I assume, tomorrow night. Any questions for Jim or other comments you want to talk about? If not, thanks, Jim. You bet. ICCSD redistricting, Iowa City. Terry, if I could say briefly, uh, uh, item E is uh, elementary attendance areas, which is something we asked to have put on the agenda. I think it's really the same topic, so maybe y'all could just address that. Yeah, I guess if you have specific questions that you want answered, we'll try our best. Um, there's going to be some specifics in what I'm going to say, and some of it's you know still going to be kind of high level. But uh, as a little preamble, at uh, the last joint meeting, we kind of broached the subject that we were going to look. Uh, a little more holistically at uh, you know how our boundaries are particularly at the elementary level and other solutions besides boundaries to have some balance of uh, demographics at our elementaries which has always been talked about and never really achieved and I believe Brockney asked what did we learn from all the previous failed efforts and I think Janet's uh, very apt uh, answer was intestinal fortitude um, I think you know, it's easy to have that strength and commitment when you really understand the why of what you're trying to do. And so what we are trying to do, and what I'm going to very briefly go through it, because I could probably talk for an hour and a half here, but um, is go through a presentation that we're trying to get out to various community groups to get that why out there, to try and build a group of allies as we start to talk of some of those specifics, whether it's boundary changes or other things, which we'll get to in the presentation, uh, more than just uh, seven board members and an admin team saying, hey, this is what we want to do. It's other people really buying into it, um, and we'll kind of get to really why we got it. So the presentation is 
level <coughs> PowerPoint, but uh, I think I've handed out, or Jana handed out some printed copies of it, and I'm kind of skip through a lot of it. It is very data heavy. Um, they're fairly quick slides, but I think it illustrates the whole point uh, as to what we're trying to do. So um, we are committed to achieving balance, and that means a lot of different things. We're looking at integration and equity in our schools. We don't, we have a very segregated society and very segregated schools, and that does not create equity in uh, educational experiences, and that's really what we're trying to drive towards. And you two can feel free to jump in anytime I'm faltering, which would probably be often. Um, I don't know that I need to really beat the drum here to this group of people to understand that diversity is important and that it makes us all a stronger community um, and that our kids in our schools, seeing diversity in the schools um, is a very positive thing. Um, it will help everybody. Um, achieve better in school but it also gives them a better kind of world picture so diversity does make us stronger and there's a lot of quotes in here from various places uh, illustrating why that is and as we kind of go through some of these other community groups and talking to them we'll probably go into a little bit more detail um, coming from the angle of they're probably less got their finger on the pulse of uh, the community than all of you folks do so I am going to kind of brush through some of this um, Really, I'd like to point out, kind of skip to the our students section. Some of these numbers, I think, are important to get out there in front of people to show how quickly we're growing, to show the changing demographics in our populations, to show our increase of English language learners, but to also show some of those disparities across the district. If you look at some of these graphs that have all of the elementaries listed out there, I think the very first one is a percent of low and high socioeconomic status and you can see when they're lined up in that pretty little graph you can see very high numbers of low SES going all the way down to very low numbers but I think one of the things to point out as you look at that you know if you look at Twain way on the left side of that and Longfellow which is almost all the way to the right side those stool schools are very close to each other you've got Kirkwood and Wickham on opposite ends that are very close geographically to each other. Um, and there's a few other examples of that. I think it's important to point out that it's not these isolated things that there's nothing we can do about. And I think that's one of the things that we can drive home is that we can do stuff and it doesn't have to be extremely radical. But <coughs> I think it, it's, it's change and so it's going to come off as radical no matter what we do. But I, I think it's important to know that within the confines of what we have to work with, I think there are plenty of opportunities that don't need to upset everybody if they're really understanding what we're trying to do. Um, so several of the other graphs kind of illustrate some of the same things. We go through a, a point about mobility in the schools. Um, that just adds another hurdle for some of the schools. The amount of kids going in and out of those schools is very different at the different ones. You add that in with uh, the, the different demographics and it, it gives you non-equitable learning environments. Um, I'm going to kind of, pretty much every one of those charts, but you guys, I apologize, out there can't see them all, but uh, they, they're illustrating a lot of the same things. Um, so kind of, what's that? <coughs> this is actually on our board docs uh, for our work session that's next week, um, so, tomorrow. or tomorrow, it's tomorrow. Jeez. I'm out of place. Um, so anybody can pull it up and look at that at some point. Um, the supports we have in place are listed here. We've done a lot of stuff to try and make things work within the school that itself, right? They implemented uh, RAM last year and, uh, you know, starting to see some benefits there, but it's not a permanent fix. Um, eventually every school would be RAM. That's the weighted resource allocation model. I see Lisa's looking at me. What's RAM? Um, basically, higher need schools are getting more uh, staff. I mean, that's the short way to answer it. But um, eventually everybody's going to need more staff or we're going to run out of money. So it, we have to do other things than just implement RAM. But there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, AVID that's down at Kirkwood is a great thing, but there's there's a limit to what all that stuff can do, particularly when we have limited funds, so what do we do in there? So now I'm getting to the now what section, which is pretty close to the end. I really did run through this fast because the now what part is why we're talking to you guys and why we're talking to some of the other uh, community groups. Um, 
the, the next page in there is our, our appendix five, and it's all of these different things to consider when you're talking about boundaries and how you're gonna you know, put a population into a school. Um, the board recently did an exercise where we all ranked our top five. There's 21 of them. Jeez, I thought there was more. But we all ranked our top five, and the one common one that everybody put is balancing, balancing socioeconomic demographics. Every single one of us put it on there, so it's pretty important to us. Um, and so we do have that intestinal fortitude, I think, to make this happen. Um, we really want to make it happen. There's a timeline in there, and it's a very aggressive timeline. Um, looking at it, you know, in this little chart here of all these little points of trying to get to the end game, it seems very fast. But the problem is it's about 20 years beyond due, so I think a, a little expedience is probably warranted. Um, as I've talked to some of the other board members in just private conversations, I think we all want to make sure that we're doing it right. We don't want to rush to something, but we do want to get it done, and we want to have some tangible change to get it done. So what can we get done, and what can you guys do to help from representing all your various groups? Um, is really helping to have that unified vision that we can put out there and showing the positives. I think uh, one of the things that we've learned, even after the last joint meeting, uh, uh, we got an email from one of the members in the audience trying to make sure <coughs> that we're looking at it from the, the positives of integration and not so much the negatives of, you know, poor people can't learn which is kind of where we tend to land a lot of times when we just look at numbers, right? And so there are a lot of positives of just integrating, you know, by race in our schools and everything else. So I, I think we need to focus on all the positives that we are going to achieve by doing some of the things that we're, we're looking at doing. Um, the last, well, maybe it's not even on there. Um, there's a, somewhere there's a slide that talks about some of the things we're considering. Um, so our uh, agenda here says we're talking about elementary attendance, and we're, we've looked at uh, boundaries uh, pretty strongly early on in this process, and that's what uh, went out in the newspapers that we're going to look at how we're drawing boundaries, and that's still a thing. Uh, I will say, um, I don't think I'm getting too far ahead of the game, that our last um, work session where we discussed this, um, but the conversation shifted a little bit to looking at uh, the paired schools option maybe earlier than changing boundaries. Um, the reason, well, many reasons for it really, but uh, one of the primary reasons is we went through a boundary process in 2016 for the 2019 school year. Does that have those dates right, Steve? So boundaries are changing in 2019 and we were looking at boundaries and looking at boundaries and we were basing everything off of 2017 numbers and trying to figure out how that translated to post 2019 numbers and we kind of had the suggestion of well if we take the 2019 boundaries that have already been worked on to a certain degree and within those confines look at pairing some of those schools that are geographically close but very disparate in populations maybe that's a, a easier first step to try um, so I we're going to go down that path too. I don't think that means we're not going to look at boundaries at all. I think we're st still going to be doing all of these things in common. I think uh, one of the things we have looked at is there are isolated schools as we looked at maps of what's the population within a mile, what's within two, what's within three, and it doesn't change a whole lot in a few places, um, which makes it difficult to draw boundaries or pair a school in that case. Um, so then you'd have to look at, okay, maybe magnet schools are the way to go, but that's definitely a longer term, uh, maybe not solution, but uh, I guess something to tackle might be, it would take longer to get something like that off the ground. So um, we're still focused on boundaries, but I think the paired schools might become maybe a more, <coughs> uh, more of a push from us as we get out there. Um, we, are, we are looking to get out to the community and parents and families that this is going to affect but we wanted to make sure that we had folks kind of in the know and allies around the table to help with the process. So as we're all well aware, as soon as a map goes out, that's when everybody comes out of the woodwork to either jump on it or say, yay, it's great. 
in order to have that be successful, I think it helps to have more people out there uh, kind of understanding the vision. Um, what we don't want to happen is have this great idea, put it out to the community, and then it all comes back with, yeah, but don't move my kids, and then everybody still goes to their closest school, and we've got the same problem that we always have. So that's really what we're trying to change is get a different perception out there and to understand that this is a good thing for everybody. Um, not everybody is going to have to move, you know, not everybody's going to have to get on a bus every day. That's not the intent. Um, but we have lofty goals, but I think this board is very committed to getting it done. Um, unfortunately, in 2019, there's four uh, board members that are then up for election again. So we want to make sure that there's at least traction and positive gains that if you know, we haven't fixed the problem. We've at least taken those steps towards fixing the problem, and we would appreciate everybody here helping us take those steps. Um, and since I did all the talking, if you have any questions, JP and Janet would be glad to answer. <laughs> <coughs> Sean, I'm curious about the parent school concept. Mm -hmm. I think that's a potentially a good one. Would that be done, though, to throughout the school district? Um, that's my first question. Related to that is that more of a comment. Normally, I like to take things slowly, and I like sort of incremental change. But I would just reaffirm that it seems like you guys think that we need to sort of get it all done at once. Um, and I would be supportive of that concept, because I just think we need to do it. It's been uh, like a tremendous amount of time. Um, so I do think it makes, normally I like, I'm a slow change guy, but here I think we got to do it and just get it done. Uh, but so in terms of the paired uh, school district, would that be throughout? Because I do think that should be if that's the approach that's used. Uh, you want to? Yeah. So um, for, the thing about paired schooling is it's not, you know, you can gain some, you can move the numbers around and get some demographic balance that way. But then you also have, that's a different structure, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a K-2 school and a 3-6 school, that, that transition also takes some time mm -hmm. for staff to, to get behind. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think, I think you're, you know, the rip the Band-Aid off mm -hmm. concept, I think that's good. But at the same time, it would be easy to do a whole lot of stuff that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and inevitably, when you make some of these changes, you're going to stumble. Mm -hmm. and, and when you stumble, that also becomes an opportunity for people, for various reasons, to then tear the whole thing down, mm -hmm. right? And so the truth is, um, you know, if so we're coming here because we're the school district. We represent all of your constituents. And we, we, we have the authority to make a change super fast. And then a new school board could be elected in two years that has the total authority to absolutely undo everything. And that's happened more than once in our community. And we're trying to be mindful that that's, we don't want that to happen. You know, we don't want this to be, this board got super excited, made a bunch of changes that ruffled lots of feathers for, because we feel it's best, and then see that dismantled really quickly. So the truth is we want, we want buy-in from you folks to say, well, what kind of a community do we want to live in as an area? I mean, we were talking before the meeting that I, I think when people move here, very few people like move to Coralville. When people move here, they're moving to our area. You know, they're looking at North Liberty, they're looking at Iowa City, they're looking at Coralville, and they're moving to our area. And the school district is a nice representation of that. That's a good selling point for our area. And what we want people to be able to do is, the Iowa City Community School District is great. No matter where you go to school, you're gonna have an equitable learning opportunity, and we have the advantage of being very diverse. So often what happens in communities, right, is white flight. So you get, uh, Des Moines is a great example. So Des Moines diversified, and now, all of the communities around Des Moines have, you know, it's, it's, it's made that a very inequitable learning. Well, we don't really have that here in the school district because, you know, we contain the suburbs of Iowa City, say, within the same school district. So we have an opportunity to make sure all of our schools really reflect our communities. And I, and I think to do that, we want to do it well. We want to get buy-in from the folks in this room. I'm telling you, we want to get buy-in from our teachers. Probably the most important people we can get buy-in from if we're going to really affect change because some of this is moving demographic numbers around but these are kids and these are kids who are having educational experiences and these are families who are going to be greatly impacted by the decisions we make and we don't want to make it worse for anyone you know we really want to say we want to create an equitable opportunity and sure some things are going to change 
but we want to make that change together. So we, we're urgent. We're moving on this. I can't tell you how many meetings we have, and we have planned, and we're going to have planned. Many meetings, many opportunities for input. Um, but as we go, we need to be very deliberate that we're bringing everyone along with us. Um, not uh, not a hundred percent of the people. Obviously, some you know we're not looking for that. But if we can get a general consensus that this area, encompassed by the Iowa City Community School District, is a vibrant, diverse place, I think that's our selling point. You know, where I grew up in Western Iowa, nobody moves there. That that is not an area of the state that is growing. People leave for lots of reasons, and a big part of it is they're not welcoming at all. You know, it's not a welcoming place. If you're outside of the majority in those areas, you, you're not welcome, and that's super obvious. And so I know lots of people from Western Iowa, Northwest, that are moving here because they've heard, oh, hey, this is a really welcoming place, a little more reflective of maybe their values. And so we want to make sure that, that we don't get this community. What we have now is we've got pockets of poverty and pockets of wealth, and the school district has an opportunity to, to blend that out a little bit. Um, I think, like Sean said, not with super radical changes. And parent schools, so where it makes the most sense, we'll probably start, would be my guess, is we want to see that work. And we want to see it work well. And so I would be shocked if we went all over the district. But at this point, we're, the conversation is fluid. and we're, I mean, from our work session last week to this week, I've learned a ton. I've learned a ton, and my thoughts are, I'm li because I'm listening to people, I'm listening to different attitudes and opinions, and the seven of us can do a lot, but the truth is we, and the admin team has a lot of expertise, but we need feedback, we need input, and we want it before we go out with all these maps and plans, and then everybody's like, you know, in it because this is how this affects my kid, and I want to tear it down. We, we want to start the conversation, this is going to affect our current kids right now, but we're really doing this to set a precedent for 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road, because we know we've... You know, 40 years ago, the, these numbers didn't exist. The, you know, 20 years ago, all of these communities looked very, very different. I think what we probably are all pretty comfortable believing is that the next 20 years is also going to look very different, but probably more diversity, more folks. Unfortunately, with the economy the way it is, we'll probably continue to have our free and reduced lunch numbers grow. And so we want to be setting the precedent for how we embrace that in our school district and so we can always with confidence you know we don't have any realtors saying don't buy a house in this part of town because the schools aren't good we want that to go away we want people to say you can buy a house anywhere in this corridor and you can feel confident that your kids will have a, at a, a top rate educational experience is so. that happening now jp what is that happening now Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. There are realtors who will scare yes. you away from parts of town. Yes. I'm going to give a, a much shorter answer to Rocky's actual question on we're going to look at paired schools across the district. I, I would say there's kind of two rules of thought. If you go out there and Google paired schools, right, mm -hmm. and you'll find a whole bunch of articles that talk about operational efficiencies is what you're going for, and maybe diversity and balance comes along with it. And then the other half is you're trying to balance demographics and maybe operational efficiencies come along with it. Obviously, there, in certain places, like North Liberty, there's most of our schools are about as equal as they're going to get with each other in terms of demographics. So the only benefit you might gain is from some of those operational efficiencies or some of the uh, team leadership learning opportunities that exist when you have bigger teams of teachers. But you're not going to change a whole lot of demographics there. And I think since our impetus is balancing demographics, we would target those areas where we have disparate populations that are close together first before we look at all of the other ones that would give us more efficiencies. But money is tight, right? And so eventually that becomes maybe the next conversation is do we implement that everywhere? Um, but I think, as, as JP said, we want to make sure that it, it works and we wouldn't want to just say, well, this is going to work everywhere, and then it fails in half the places because it wasn't the right thing for it. So I think we'll target the ones that we really think it's going to, you know, get us what we're looking for, which is, you know, balancing the, the demographics. If I could, I, I don't have a question to ask, but I want to tell you briefly about 
an eye-opening and inspiring tour that Rockney and I took part in in mid-June. And there are a couple parts of it that I think connect to what the school district's trying to do. So this was um, about 50 people went down to civil rights sites in the South. Maybe 25 to 30 of the people on the tour were black kids from our school system. And part of what I heard, Rockney, you tell me if uh, I misheard any of this, part of what I heard when we went to really wonderful museums and major sites uh, uh, that were prominent in the civil rights movement was how come we never learn about this in our in the history that we're taught? We're taught MLK, we're taught the March on Washington, the speech. How come we don't know about all this really amazing stuff that people did? So that's one thing. Uh, the, the second has to do with the, all the HBCUs, you know, historically black uh, colleges and universities that we visited. While we were there, our black youth saw black administrators, black teachers, black role models, and they felt vastly more comfortable. At least that's the impression I got, and it certainly is what I was hearing from, from our black youth. So therein lies a challenge. You know, we have a larger number of black kids in our school. Now, I don't mean, I don't want to reduce all this to just black kids, of course, but we have a larger number of black kids in our school, and we can't have you know, 50% black administrators, I suppose. But, you know, they need to be able to see role models that really matter to them so they can say, oh, yeah, I get it. You know, I, I want to weigh in uh, and agree with what Jim just said because I have two children who have never seen a teacher or an administrator that looks like them. And I think that. I, I, I hope that we can do this piece of the work and get this out of the way and do this in a meaningful and successful way and then we can move on to the next challenge which is making sure that we are integrating our teaching staff. It makes a difference. You know, my son went to the orientation at Northwest Junior High and he came home and he said, Mom, they have a black teacher there and he's never seen that before. And it's, it's, Jim is right, it means so much to these kids. So I wish you well. I and I just want to say I love the idea of a, the paired schools from a, a community standpoint as well because I think that that, I, I love the idea of that because I feel like it, even, you know, within our communities, you know, we kind of just only know the Coralville Central parents or we only know the Kirkwood parents or, you know, and so I love the idea of the paired schools because that kind of gets everybody um, intermingling more and it broadens the, the net, I think, of support for everybody in the community. So <clears throat> speaking of broadening a net, the net you cast for recruiting um, teachers and administrators is going to need to be bigger in order to recruit people that are are more diverse and then once you've done that and they have been able to you know eventually get to a place where there's a, um, a more colorful palette let's say then um, you have to think about retention which is a really big thing that I hear from my friends uh, that you know different things are important to them culturally they have to travel away from this area for so um, there are a lot of pieces that come would have to come together, but it is doable and and important. And the recruitment and retention of teachers and administrators of color is a very big uh, priority for our board and administrative team. We talked about it a lot uh, in work sessions in the last few months. And these things go hand in hand. I mean, we need to show and demonstrate our commitment to equity and integration in our schools so that we can successfully recruit and then retain teachers and administrators of color. If we try to do one without the other, I think I think both sets of activities will not be sustainable. So I think we're trying to be very deliberate around not just moving kids from school to school to balance the schools. We have to put the conditions 
into the schools that will help those schools maintain that balance. And one of the big conditions is teachers of color, so that students see themselves. It's a, we, there's all kinds of strands of work that go together with this. Not one thing is going to make it successful. It's a whole bunch of things. And again, I think this is why we're looking for all of your support around this is a good thing for our community. This is a good thing for our students. It's a good thing for our businesses. It's a good thing for you know the success and growth of, of our corridor area. And um, I think the most that we can all kind of link arms, tell that story, help promote that vision through all of our lenses uh, would be fantastic. And so we're eager to hear and listen and learn ideas that you have. So, because we are committed to this, we are committed to making this change happen and we're committed to making this change stick. It's been a long time since I've had an education, higher ed, uh, education class, so I don't entirely understand parent schools, but if I'm hearing correctly, you're training students? No, you, you could have, um, for example, one, uh, look at Longfellow and Twain. Uh, they're very, very close together. And they're so, close if you have a car. Well, they're just close. Whether or not you have a car, there are kids who live within walking distance of both of those schools that, that could probably fill almost both of those schools, okay. right? So. Um, so then maybe one is K2, and all the K2 kids in that whole area go there, and the other one is 3-6, and all the 3-6 kids go there. Um, what you get with that, um, aside from demographic balance, you do get some operational efficiency. You, know, you can just be more efficient with your class sizes, and you can end up saving some teacher slots. And then the other thing that's exciting for staff is if I'm in a building with one or two fifth grade teachers, I don't have a whole lot of folks to collaborate with. But if I'm in a building full of fifth, sixth grade teachers, that really opens up the, the potential collaboration opportunities. And you can target your resources so your library can be focused on that age group of kids. And that gives you some efficiencies that way, too. So Maybe it's more comfortable for the kids, too, because they're with peers, oh, not, yeah. Yeah, if you not a first grader with a sixth grader. There's some, yeah. There are those kind of bullying things. Yeah, a lot of that stuff goes away, for sure. And so, so there are some advantages, right? The, the disadvantage would be more school transitions. Okay, that's, that's a, a down. And then, yeah, you have a bigger geographical area, so you need to be more mindful of how, you know, you just, that's logistics, figuring out. You know, we don't, what we don't want to do is just a whole lot more busing, right? That's not what we're looking for. We're going to do this in really targeted, smart ways uh, to max, I mean, we haven't complained a lot, but if you haven't noticed, you know, the state has not been nice to us, funding-wise, <laughs> for a decade. And a decade of, of lack of funding, I mean, we right now the district is doing pretty good. We're going to come up on some very, very lean years. And we're going to have some tough spot. We're going to come out of it and we'll be okay. But we're going to come up against some really difficult conversations in our community about the value, the monetary value we place on education, unless obviously things change in Des Moines, then that, that picture becomes different. But. Right now, we're faced with some pretty stark reality. So just aside from demographics, some of these operational efficiencies she was talking about may really come into play with that paired schools discussion. I, I like the thing, too. And another thing I like about the pairing is it, the geographics of it that we could, as a city, a city, like a city, looking as the pairings become clearer, and you've already explained a few, looking at the connectivity between those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so we we don't end up with busing. We, we actually have a legitimate, safe, comfortable ways for the yeah. kids to get and you know beyond their own neighborhood, which I think is kind of an exciting idea, yeah. as long as there are ways to do it. Right. Any more discussion or comments? Thank you very much. Johnson County Comprehensive Plan. Iowa City has to put this on the agenda. I've talked with uh, Kurt about it a little bit because uh, he's one board member I've seen recently and, and indicated that all we were looking for <coughs> was a sort of brief, some brief summary about what you all tried to accomplish in the comp plan. We know you adopted it and I'm not trying to open a, up a can of worms, just get a, a, a you know, high level overview of the comp plan. Want to take that part? Uh, just to introduce you, I mean, I was going to do it, but you're here. So We'll let you vote it. <laughs> so, Josh Bissard, director of PDS. Uh, so, as uh, the mayor said, we uh, recently uh, adopted 
the 28 Johnson County Comprehensive Plan. It was a collaboration of almost uh, two years. Uh, we had focus group keel, stakeholder interviews, open houses, surveys to the public. Uh, there were, I, you know, I lost count, we, way over 20 public meetings overall. Um, and the plan it managed and focuses residential growth. Uh, it preserved agricultural land and environmentally sensitive areas in the unincorporated areas of Johnson County. Yeah, uh, I would expect this plan is going to guide development uh, in the unincorporated county for uh, the next decade or, or more. And uh, the county's unified development ordinance or subdivision code or zoning code, sensitive areas ordinance, um, all those development ordinances are going to be updated based on this uh, plan and staff is uh, recently we, we started that undertaking so and the plan it contains chapters on sustainability local economy infrastructure and amenities uh, and of course land use and uh, talks in great detail about how we're going to implement this plan which is uh, quite argu arguably the, uh, the most important chapter in this plan uh, there are some changes so uh, I think the most obvious change is that the new growth, that new growth areas have been <coughs> identified, uh, but a concerted effort uh, was made to keep county growth areas uh, outside of identified growth areas. So for example, we looked at where cities uh, have the uh, ability to run services, where they intend to run those services, what their plans are for in the future as they intend to grow. And we wanted to uh, make an effort and I believe that we did to stay out of those areas to allow cities to grow as, as you guys see fit. And uh, sort of piggybacking off that same topic, another goal of the comp plan of which there were 20 goals, 57 strategies, and I think 133 action steps off the top of my head. <coughs> uh, maybe there's 134, I can't remember. But, uh, but again, one of those goals, it, the comp plan was uh, read to read note uh, renegotiate our fringe area agreements, so those 2080 intergovernmental agreements that dictate how land develops in the extraterritorial extra areas uh, outside the corporate boundaries, which essentially is two miles away from the city limits. Um, and uh, I'll be contacting you. I started with Oxford, and I've also had a conversation with Tiffin, and I've actually I've already met with Oxford City Council. So uh, we will be contacting you. I'm quite aware that there are some contested areas, but I'm confident that we can all work through this and come up with some fringe area agreements that are going to be mutually beneficial uh, to both the city and county, and everybody's interests can be protected. Um, Should be pointed out he started with Oxford because <coughs> they don't have one. Yeah. fringe area agreements so. of any sort. And Tiffins is expired, and the Coralville's is next. So, anyway, so if there are any questions, if you want to view the plan, it's on the county's website, uh, or you can here it is. <laughs> so, anything? I'd like to drive home the point that, that Josh touched on. That still seems to be a bit of a uh, uh, misconception for an awful lot of people, at least in the public, anyway, that the comp plan didn't change any ordinances. Uh, it lays out the planning for how we're going to do that, and that's the UDO, and that's where the rubber meets the road and where things are actually going to change and will hopefully improve. Um, but uh, none of that stuff has actually happened simply because we passed the comp plan. So we intend to make our zoning code, our subdivision code, uh, more sustainable. We want to strengthen our sensitive areas ordinance, uh, preserves topsoil, uh, better manage stormwater. Uh, we want to consider what we consider to be a farm and how we work with the uh, agricultural exemption. Uh, and another large portion of the plan was devoted to, uh, to uh, food policy as well. And ag tourism. And ag tourism. Any other comments or questions? Good deal. Thanks for Thank doing that. Thank you. <clears throat> Iowa City's Climate Action and Adaption Plan. Yeah, so I think you all know that we've been working on the development of a climate action and adaptation plan. A couple weeks ago, we received a presentation from steering committee members uh, 
concerning a draft action uh, <coughs> adaptation plan. Actually, it focused on the action part of it, not so much the adaptation. The adaptation's coming shortly. And uh, last week we had a community meeting that involved 100 to 120 or so people. Some of you, I think, were present for that meeting. A lot of really energetic uh, conversation about uh, various steps that individuals can make, either working as individuals with other individuals or working uh, as part of organizations, linking up with other organizations. So that was pretty exciting. And sometime within the next, so within the next two months, I, I don't know exactly when, we'll have uh, that draft come to us as a final draft and we'll be asked to adopt it or amend it or whatever we choose to do with it. But I'm really excited about the progress we've made on it. It, uh, you know, is a significant step forward. And I'm hopeful to be able to go to a major event in San, in San Francisco come mid-September in which I could join mayors from cities around the world to talk about what they have been doing to uh, take major steps with regard to climate action. So I wanted you all to know about that draft plan. It, you'll see a final version of it sometime fairly soon. Anything for Jim? Thank you. Yep. For Reg Bry. We've asked Jeff, <coughs> our very fine city manager, to tell us a little bit about this, and then I think Tim's going to chip in and maybe some others. Yeah, uh, Jeff Fruin, city manager for Iowa City, and before the riders make their way into Iowa City, they have to make their way through hills. We hope that they continue up the road eventually. But <laughs> We've got a bag pipe player that might just push them out of town. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Yeah, so maybe I defer to you on the, uh, on the update first, uh, since you'll be, you'll be seeing the riders before we will. Okay, uh, we've got our theme is Hills is Alive with the Sound of Music. Um, we've got a variety of bands. Uh, could not get the council to dress in lederhosen. Uh, greet the riders as they came into town. Uh, we're going to have stuff set up at the park. We've got the community center. Some local uh, nonprofits are going to be serving there. The 218 tap will be at the park and at their bar. Rustic Revival, one of our newer businesses, is going to have things going on at their place. So. Yeah, our big guess is when are they going to first start showing up, you know, with Riverside, Kelowna, all about seven miles away. You know, we figure it's going to be just a slow, steady stream, and uh, I'm sure the Highway Patrol will come in around 5, 5.30 and start pushing them up your way. Tim, is, one of, is Julie Andrews one of the riders? <laughs> <laughs> We're hoping. We're hoping. Great thing. Well, first, uh, before I get into just a really brief overview of what we're doing, I, I need to say thank you to pretty much all the organizations up here because uh, we could not do this ourselves. Uh, we have asked for help from county, school district, the cities, uh, and you've all absolutely said, yes, we'll, we'll do what we can to help you. Uh, you've served on committees, you've provided resources, really, really appreciate it. Of course, Coralville is one of the more experienced cities uh, in, the, in the state in hosting this. So, They've been gracious enough to, to share, us, share with us all kinds of tips and tools for RAGBRAI, and, and frankly, if we can host as half as good as they have in recent years, we'll be A-OK. -okay. Um, our plans, we will have the main campgrounds at City Park and the main entertainment zone in, in downtown Iowa City. We'll have about 12 blocks of downtown blocked off. We're going to start road closures on Thursday, and we'll do most of them on, on Friday when the riders are coming into town. It is free entertainment, so the public is uh, encouraged to come down uh, and enjoy the music that we have and all the other festivities. Uh, travel around Iowa City is going to be difficult on Friday. The riders are coming in Sand Road from Hills. They'll come up Gilbert. We're going to take them around downtown through the campus, uh, down by Hancher and into City it's Park. It's not going to be any harder than it already is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the next item on the agenda there. <laughs> Uh, so if you want to get east-west in Iowa City on that Friday, we're only going to be allowing east-west uh, along the route on highway, on the highway, on Burlington Street, and on Kirkwood. So uh, everything will get funneled to those intersections to get you across. Otherwise, expect some delays, and if you can avoid it, uh, that's probably best altogether. Any questions about our plans? Do you have a shuttle from... The park to downtown. Yes, we'll have we'll have a shuttle from City Park to downtown. 
We also have some campsites. We have some camping over at Mercer. Uh, Southeast Junior High, I think, is participating with us on hosting some riders out there. And then we have some RV parking down <coughs> by Cherry True Blood at our Public Works campus. So our, our shuttle will hit all three of those locations. My Jeff. question is actually for Janelle. Do we have all the houses? Yeah, Ryan O'Leary stepped up at the end to put the final RVs in what is the Paul's parking lot <clears throat> and is wiring some outside electricity apparently for them. Um, we had been running kind of short. Um, we didn't have nearly as many requests as they get out west. I've been the co-chair of the housing, but um, I'm told we're, at, we're finished, and so that's good. Although I, I took a... Facebook message, uh, Adaptive Sports, the team that has differently abled people, um, they are staying at the Iowa City Rec Center, and I think they have 60 members, and they are looking for a team of volunteers to help them Friday morning set up all of their um, beds and gear. And in other towns, they've used scout troops or, or collective groups of kids volunteering it they say it takes about two hours with these 60 riders and the riders are so exhausted when they get there they can't really even roll out their own beds and stuff and so I said surely in our great community we could figure that out and I think I was contacted just because I know them from right right but so the, I I believe that you guys are doing pretty well on the volunteer slots like there's still some empty ones yeah we still have uh, room to take more but we feel pretty good for where we stand campground is where we need them the most and that's probably the toughest assignment as more well. people out the campground yeah. so what do, they, what do they do your volunteers at the campground uh, directing directing folks uh, there's an information center out there they're running ice uh, but just a lot of logistics picking up probably the next day picking up trash yeah. trash and recycling so I, I, how many slots? I, someone told me, but I don't remember. I should have checked before I, I came, but I, I don't recall where we're at now. It's getting closer, but yeah. there's still a need for volunteers, and then this adaptive sports would be <coughs> separate, not through the normal volunteer, but yep. if anyone has a group of people that could volunteer on Friday morning to help them Agreed. set up in the rec center. I don't know where you're putting them in the rec center, but that's what I was told. Yeah, I guess I, the I, community pro room. Probably the, the gym and the community we do, uh, if you know of riders that haven't found housing, we are the only host city, at least as of last week, that has placed all the housing orders, thanks to uh, Janelle, who's co-chair of that committee. But the, sh the former Sheridan, the now graduate, just today opened up 90 rooms that they did not think were going to be ready nice. by RAGBRAI. Uh, so now we have 90 extra hotel rooms. So that's been posted out on social media. If you know riders that are still looking, it's a good, good tip. They'll probably go pretty quick. Jeff, do you want to just mention real quickly the whole Dubuque Street Park Road situation? Yes. Uh, so uh, <laughs> coming down here, I took Dubuque Street, and my one worry is there's still about an 8-foot, 10-foot gap between the existing roadway and that bridge. Uh, we are planning to use that bridge for RAGBRAI. It will be limited to RAGBRAI support vehicles only. Oh. So it's important to keep the RVs and the support vehicles off of the bike route. <laughs> so we're taking them. They're, they're, they're going up to Williamsburg and coming in on I-80. And they'll have passes uh, that will allow them access onto the Park Road Bridge to get them across to City Park. But we still have we still have a little ways to go to get that connection made. And then coming out of town, they'll be able to use the Park Road Bridge to get back on I-80 as well. Uh, it'll just again be for the RAGBRAI support vehicles. You'll have to have a, a tag to, to get across the bridge. But uh, thankfully, PCI was able to to work that out with us, and the DOT was willing to grant us that access. Otherwise, it would have been difficult to sneak folks in uh, the back way through Manville Heights uh, and Coralville. Um, at one point, the park that's going up to the south of the administration building, you all said you thought would be done by then. Do you still think that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I looked out my window today. And no, we, have, um, okay. we, we still have a restroom shelter and all the electrical that, that's being uh, built right now. Okay. Uh, we, we thought at one point that we could squeeze that in, but we had to reject bids early on and rebid, so it slowed us down. Who else is riding? Is anybody else riding? I sure. was until I got pneumonia. <clears throat> have a good time. Yeah. <clears throat> and then Friday, hosting my own team. So. <laughs> Appreciate that. At your house? At my house. Right. <laughs>
Lisa, you had a job too that got assigned to you. <laughs> Mary and Carr found out Lisa needed work and just up the ante on her. Janelle volunteered me. <laughs> oh. You work in the beverage garden with Marion? I'm working in the beer garden. Yeah. She got volunteered. Yeah, right. With Lynn and Paul. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Major road project updates for Iowa City. <laughs> you can <laughs> come back. <laughs> Welcome again. Okay, uh, I thought we were busy, and then I drove up. I tried to drive up to North Liberty, and wow! Uh, I told Ryan I drove by Front and Zeller, and down 965, there wasn't a road that wasn't torn up here. So, uh, it, it's definitely all over. Real quick update on some city projects. I mentioned Park Road Bridge. Park Road will be open to the general public by middle to late August. Uh, certainly pushing hard for that first football game to uh, handle the, the large volumes of traffic that we get with that. We do appear to be on schedule to, to hit that uh, deadline. The Dodge and uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Burlington and Governor project is underway. It's a resurfacing project. They've started on Burlington and then will make their way up the state highway onto Governor. Uh, that will take most of the construction season to finish that project. And at the end, uh, those two streets will receive bike lanes as well. The Highway 6 project, you'll notice in Coralville, uh, it has a nice section of Highway 6 recently resurfaced. That work's going to continue into Iowa City on, on Highway 6 past the VA down to uh, the Hampton Inn on Riverside Drive there. That project, I believe, started today with some intersection work at Myrtle Avenue. I didn't make it out there to see if the crews mobilized, but I believe they did. Myrtle Avenue will be a signalized intersection. That's where the old come and go used to be. Thank you. <laughs> My that wife's family <coughs> over there, <coughs> going there, we've seen so many accidents yes. there. Yeah. Uh, hopefully you still clap when I tell you we're going to close that intersection for 60 days at the end of July uh, to do that work. <laughs> That's but, Scott Tracy's problem. Yep. <laughs> uh, so that, that uh, again, starts today, and then the, that intersection closure, getting access uh, onto Riverside will we'll close for 60 days while we improve that intersection and get the lights installed. Other uh, major uh, project that we have is the Burlington and Clinton project that has been under construction for several months. We are about a month behind. We were supposed to be completely done with that before RAGBRAI. Unfortunately, we're not going to make that deadline. Uh, we're, we're good enough to where the pavement will be restored, but the bike lanes that are going on Clinton will not be done until uh, probably the middle of August now, a few weeks behind. Anything for the gentleman? I'm just checking my list here, making sure you don't have to come up again. <laughs> okay, general entity updates from the folks who want to contribute. Anything to say? Can we hear more about North Liberty's roads? Because I really got myself turned around getting here. I thought I was so smart dodging all the construction, and then can we? Are you willing to tell us more? Sure. I'm obviously not smart enough to have gotten here. Ryan Heyer uh, with the City of North Liberty. So we have a number of things going on, as Jeff mentioned. We have Front Street, uh, and that is um, Front Street from uh, Zeller to Cherry right now is under full construction. Now that actually, that project has uh, uh, come along very nicely and should be opened up here hopefully within the next 35 to, to 45 days. So. <clears throat> Pleasantly surprised with how quickly that project has has moved along. 965, beg your pardon, Ranshaw Way <coughs> uh, is under construction on the North Liberty side from from uh, Penn Street all the way down to Zeller. And, and Jeff alluded to a, a, a detour we have there now. Zeller Street's closed. I think for the next, I think it's about 30 days, uh, and so. Uh, if you're familiar with the area, you have to go, uh, you have to take a right by fairway on Westwood Drive uh, to head north to, if you want to access Zeller. So that we, throughout that whole project, we've had different closes on Cherry Street, on Zeller Street. And what we've done each time is given the contractor so many days that they can be within that, have that intersection closed. So the goal is to try to keep each intersection closed uh, as little as possible, obviously. So, uh, 
Ryan, what exactly is being done? Because I remember not that many years ago, everything was closed down to put those big stripes in the middle of the street. So what are we getting this time? So the, what you'll see now from Zeller, or from Penn to Zeller, is the full build out of 965. That's what it'll look like all the way down. <coughs> Excuse me, I keep saying 965. It's Rancho Way now. All the way down <laughs> Rancho Way. So it'll be five lanes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, with a, so two two lanes north, two lanes south, and then a center turn. And then in this particular project, we have sidewalk, uh, we have a trail on one side, sidewalk on another, pedestrian lighting. And we're actually, as part of this project, working with the DOT, and Coralville's in on this as well, where we'll have adaptive, I'm going to get the term wrong, but it's adaptive signal technology. Mm -hmm. And so instead of doing traffic counts uh, and adjusting our timings every few months or even every year, this will actually do it every day, every second, at, depending on what the traffic is doing. It's about a million dollar upgrade, and the DOT is fronting that entire cost for us as a result of the work that they're doing on uh, I-380 right now. And Ryan, that, is that the project that allows your fire departments and police to trigger the lights? That software will allow it, but we will not have that capability with what we're putting in now. So I that would be an additional add-on. So do you plan to do that, though? We haven't, we <coughs> haven't talked about that right now. Both the police and fire chiefs uh, are not overly concerned with that. They haven't had uh, major issues at this point, but it's something I'm sure as we continue to grow and traffic grows, we'll discuss it. Because we heard about Lisa and I from Fiona Johnson, the ambulance director, she thought it was a done deal. Is Coralville doing it then? Yes. And Coralville. you are doing it. Yeah, we just okay. need to make sure that they're all coordinates. We, we <laughs> wanted to explore how do we get to be part of that because getting our ambulances through intersections is problematic and dangerous. And and I don't think Fiona had figured that out yet the last time we talked about it. But And so just another little piece to that puzzle is Coralville <clears throat> Excuse me, Coralville and North Liberty have different software systems, and so we're in in order for in order for one community to switch, it, it would have oh, added extreme costs to either one. So of them. Coralville's doing that, but North Liberty isn't at this point. Well, we're both putting in the adaptable signal okay. technology, and Coralville will have one uh, additional module, we'll call it, that we won't have right away. But it's something we'll be uh, looking at down the road. So we have front, we have 965, and then you're pricing a lot of work out there uh, at the I-380 interchange. Uh, the DOT says that that bridge will be open uh, by, the, the new bridge will be open by the end of the year. Of course, the ramps uh, won't be open until the end of next year. Uh, in the meantime, we're working on everything wet, or excuse me, everything east into the community uh, on Forever Green Road. So from, from uh, Jones Boulevard all the way out to the new bridge will be uh, a new urban section roadway. Uh, also happening out there is Kansas Avenue Extension. Uh, this project uh, is, is partially funded by a RISE grant. Uh, when GEICO made their announcement, uh, we worked with the state to obtain about $2 million uh, in grant funding. And so that the reconstruction of that is going on right now, which includes a roundabout just south of the North Bend Elementary School. Uh, so it should really uh, improve traffic flow out there. And then the last thing I'll mention, and we've had a number of conversations with the school district on this, but we're currently in design uh, for two roundabouts on Front Street, farther uh, north uh, than the existing project. This would be at Penn in Front, with which it makes <coughs> travel at Penn in Front. Oh my gosh. Uh, especially in the evenings, especially on a Friday evening when campers and boats are coming through there, it's a disaster. Uh, so we're acquiring three properties at that intersection. We're about probably 25, 30 percent through design right now, and then we're going to be putting another roundabout uh, at the South Slope entrance, which will also be Christine Grant entrance, the Christine Grant entrance. So we'll have a nice roundabout there as well. So that project's under design, uh, and if everything goes as planned, we'll be uh, out for bid later this year, construction next year, and both roundabouts opened. Uh, before August of 2019. Did I miss anything, Mayor? No, I thought we officially opened the water plant. Yes, yeah, that, that was a big uh, big deal for us. We, uh, 
uh, invested about uh, just over $20 million in a new water plant. Uh, our old one obviously was not, didn't have the capacity or capability to keep up and it made sense to invest in a, to uh, a whole new facility. And so we're excited about that. Our water quality is noticeably better uh, and uh, it's in everything after 30 days of running is still running well so that's so did the other one shut down or do you have two no the other one is shut down <coughs> but it, we will now use that as a uh, one of the things we struggle with here at the city is space and storage and so this will be what we call a distribution shop where all of our distribution parts our water main parts valves couplers everything you can think of will be stored there and so that'll um, when we have an issue, we'll have easy access to, to that equipment. How old was that one? I want to say 77, but I could I could be wrong. I, I'm sorry, I don't know that off the top of my head. I probably shouldn't even said that, that 1977, because that may not be right. Well, don't feel bad about still calling it 965. Some of us still call it 218. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Some people call it old too. Thank old you. Too. Thanks, Ryan. Right. Anything from anybody else? Um, down in Hills, our road construction wasn't quite as elaborate as the report you just heard. <laughs> in fact, when Ragbride came to us, they said we could pick any way in and out of town we wanted for the riders. I don't think they realized there was only one way in and out of town. <laughs> <laughs> we debated whether to have them go on every street, take them by each <laughs> village, but uh, we took them down Main Street. Uh, but with a, we added a lagoon to our treatment plant. With that, we were able to take part with a, a SRF project that allowed us to finish our Main Street. We repaved Main Street and then added some permeable pavers uh, there on Main Street. And those seem to be working quite nicely. We had the Secretary of Agriculture and some state senators come out for our little ribbon cutting, which was uh, always nice. And then we realized it was an election year, so mm -hmm. probably why we had the turnout we did. <laughs> uh, and then just today, we opened up our little splash pad, the northeast corner of our yeah. new park. So nice. excited about that. Small but mighty, it is right. Nice. Okay. Think from anyone else. Corville, want to tell us what's going on the other direction on nine six five? Sure. We have Ellen, our assistant city administrator here. Because I've been doing everything to avoid that detour. <laughs> Hi. Um, well, the detour isn't that bad. No. It really isn't. Um, so right now, south of just south of here on Coral Ridge Avenue is what we call it, or 965. We are reconstructing. We'll have four lanes when we're finished, just like the part that we did from Oakdale to Holiday Road. So we'll have four complete lanes, and that will be our final reconstruction of Coral Ridge Avenue in Coralville. We are detouring right now through the research park. Um, we just had a, a little traffic flow change last weekend, and so things are now we've rebuilt the north side of Oakdale Boulevard. So that's going a little smoother, and that intersection is reopened. So um, construction is on track. It's about 25% complete, um, but it won't be finished until late fall, until the end of the construction season. So um, it's going well, but it is, um, you know, it's going to take some time. And then the DOT is working on adding a lane southbound to get onto Interstate 80. And like the, a lot of these other projects, this is all leading up to the big interchange improvements at 80 and 380. So um, you'll also see construction down there towards um, the Coles intersection. And so that's a DOT project. I don't have as much information on that one. Over on First Avenue, there too, we've got the, we've already got four lanes and a turn lane, but they were four very narrow lanes and it was very aged. So we're rebuilding all that, making it wider, getting the continuous center turn lane, improving pedestrian access, and improving the railroad crossing. We'll also improve the 6th Street intersection, and that will be the, just the 6th Street intersection part should open by August 15th. So that one's making progress too. Again, it'll be late fall before we get everything reopened and traffic gets back to normal. Any questions? I have a question as somebody who takes that detour every day. Yeah. Uh, the one oh, thing that yeah, always you concerns me oh, when you're, let's say I'm going to get it wrong, eastbound on Oakdale and you're getting ready to turn north on the Cross Park, it's, it's a left turn that you get a green light, not a green arrow. Mm -hmm. And everybody stops waiting for the oncoming traffic to and go. And they honk at you. And then about half the people who have done it before know that they just go, and the other half aren't sure oh. what to do. So it would make Signage. sense for it to just to be an arrow or have a sign 
there's something there because yeah. it does everybody stops for a second yeah. not quite not sure knowing. yeah I'll and pass that on I don't think we can switch the ball to an arrow but we can maybe um, just put a sign up or something yeah like a that. sign would yeah. be really helpful because I did it I mean I stopped because there was a car coming the other <laughs> way and oh the person behind me almost hit me and blur mm -hmm. and I, uh, horn and my husband's yelling and I said I always kind of look back and see that they have a red I light before know? I turn yeah. Yeah. yeah we've been making adjustments there since the change because there are people you know that two or three weeks that they did it one way and they've had a difficult time adjusting to the way it used to be so but and so we've been making changes but I'll pass that on and let them know that 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 would be helpful real helpful <laughs> anything else Thank want you. to talk about zipper merging? Zipper merging <laughs> is very welcome and appreciated. Sorry Take turns, be nice. You know, yeah. It's, um, it, First, it's you guys well. made us learn roundabouts. Now <laughs> you want us to zipper merge. Four of those always on the cutting edge of tech. You know, All of these traffic. traffic. You know, it does. It, it helps with backups a lot if, you, um, if you're just willing to be that person that goes up there. And I know that a lot of us don't usually like the person goes up there in that other lane. But I've tried it. You know, if I if I stay in the line with the long line, I always let people in. If I if I go up there, people have been good about letting me in. So go ahead and give it a try. You, it, it really it will work. You can do it. It's I, it's good to set an example. Zipper merging isn't anything compared to what we have planned for that intersection of coming off of uh, right uh, there by I just noticed that the <laughs> Iowa polite is still in. So people aren't totally zipper merging. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's, it's gonna hard. take a while to it's teach hard. us that that's okay. Yeah. Well, the Somebody signs from the that Gazette say be actually. nice are kind of cute. Take In Texas, they nice. say drive friendly. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, that too. Somebody from the Gazette actually yeah, said to us, you know, hard. the DOT couldn't do it. What makes you think you can? That's but good. you know, we're we're gonna keep trying. We've got all all summer to do it. <laughs> Thank you. As far as our projects, Ron has the most recent because I missed the meeting. The liaison. No, Lord. I'm not prepared to report on anything, am I? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would just forget stuff. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't come prepared to do that. Well, I'll, I'll just say this, that um, if when you're coming out of Tiffin, this is not from, it, no Tiffin person is here, is it? When you come out of Tiffin going north to try to get into North Liberty, you can't do that unless you're a bird um, because both roads going north are dug up. So your options are either getting on the interstate or half moon. And the interstate, as you know, is also under construction. So people have been going on a half moon, which is gravel and very dusty. So. Um, Greg Parker, our engineer, and I are going to be talking to the city engineer of, of Tiffin tomorrow to see you about maybe jig, some. jag through the neighborhood, which is what I did the other night, going from the picnic to North Liberty Blues and Barbecue. Where do you end up coming out? You end up up the same way at Sentman's Road. Okay. But you have to... You have to know what you're doing. Oh, okay. and I, I, didn't know I was like, "Wow, well, no, this is under construction. It's hard." But from Highway <coughs> Six, yeah, you have to go down to the gas station, turn left, and go. Oh, up. okay, yeah. I know that way then. Okay. So our projects, a, a number of them, are wrapping up for the year. We still have bridge projects going on. We finished um, what we call Oak Crest Hill Road, a box culvert we needed to do for Ragbird. I mean, we've been putting it off stealing the money to other projects they got finished IWV got reopened um, so well part of it part of it yeah <laughs> so we haven't inconvenienced people as much as we have in past years um, Ely Road it's under construction but that will be a two-year project and the the one question everyone asks is when will the trail be done and that that will be next year so the trail and the road, uh, the Ely Road, will be finished in the construction year of next year. Mahaffey Bridge Trail, though, will be open this year. Are we forgetting anything anyone has questions about? Okay, we'll move on. Next meeting date and time. Yeah. Any bids? Johnson County hosting. And it's, it's October 15th. October. Thank you for helping us out. Oh, 
I, I wonder if we want to talk about trading with somebody simply because that's getting close to election time. The auditor usually closes our oh, meeting room to store absentee that's ballots. Fine. I don't know when they're going to close it. But even if they don't by that point, we run into some parking and other issues the closer we get to election day. I just I wonder if whoever would be the one after that would trade us. But then the one after that would be October, right? No, no this, this is October. October. Oh, October. Heard. Okay, good. So is Iowa City willing to do October and we'll take whatever the next one is, February? So we're next in the queue, that's what you're saying, Julie? Yeah, sure, why not? Thank okay. You. Thank, Thank you. you for that. Iowa City, October 15th. So yep. January will be ours then, right? Three months later, November. To, yeah, January, my bad. Can't count. Very good. Anyone present wishing to make a public comment while you're still here? Can I just say, my name is Bob Ralph. Uh, I guess I just want to reiterate my thoughts <coughs> in terms of uh, cooperating with one another. Uh, I was particularly impressed today with statements from the school district and the importance of a unified vision in terms of the description, in terms of what kind of a community do we really want this to be. Uh, so, you know, I'm a retired minister. I felt like saying several times, amen, in your <laughs> statements. Uh, half of you were at the event where we kicked off a community dialogue on helping to make Johnson County a more liberal community. Um, we just had a meeting this morning to go into a, put that on a fast track now. And so we'll be contacting you all at that point. But I just want to thank you for all that you're doing, you know, in the communities, and the, um, in the county, to really help make this a livable community. And, uh, my goal is, uh, before I die, uh, that more than people will recognize that Johnson County is really the place to live. Uh, and regardless of how old you are, uh, this is where you should live. And, uh, and so thank you all very much. Thank you. Any other comment? Can we go back to scheduling real quick before you gavel? Well, sure. <laughs> Just because I was going to enter it in my phone, I realized that when we would meet in January is Martin Luther King's birthday. So you all, I need to decide whether you want to meet the week before or the week after. So the 21st is MLK. So either the 14th or 28th of January. Anyone have a preference? Week before. Okay, 14 it is. Anything else? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attendance and time. We are adjourned.